welcome back everybody. Now it's with great pleasure I introduce our second speaker, Matthew Johnson. Matthew is a lecturer in English language teaching and bilingual education at the Centro Universitario Cisnero, Cardenal de Cisneros, I always get yeah. the order <laughs> wrong, and also he um, teaches on a master's program at the Franklin Institute here in Madrid. He's a very experienced teacher and teacher trainer. He's also um, collaborated with different publish uh, with mm -hmm. publications, um, materials writing, etc. So he's got a vast, broad experience in education. And today he's going to talk to us about literacy, much more than just reading and writing. So welcome, Thank Matthew. you very much. So first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Macmillan, for inviting me. Um, I get a, a captive audience now to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is um, the idea of literacy and the idea that it is a great deal more than just reading and writing, which is how it's sometimes conceived. Um, but I think literacy is kind of the foundation of education in, in general, really. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is related more specifically to uh, pre-primary and primary level and in the English language classroom, in the foreign language classroom. But many of the principles that I talk about are also completely applicable to the mother tongue and in fact across uh, you know, all subjects, really. So um, hopefully it will be useful and, and maybe we'll give uh, some of you a, a, you know, a, a bit of a new take on, uh, on how we can deal with literacy in the classroom. So um, I'd like to start off with a question. Um, and the question is this, well the statement is, we have to motivate kids to read in pre-primary and primary. And you have two options, you either agree or you disagree. But be careful because the answer seems obvious but perhaps it's a trick question. So let's see what you think. Okay, and people are responding very quickly, thank you. Um, at the moment, is that 100% agree with mm -hmm. this, this statement that we have to motivate kids to read in pre-primary and primary? It's an Unsurprising. absolute obligation. Yeah. Okay, now it's slightly changing, mm -hmm. and we're going down to 80-odd, 87, 88% agreeing, and uh, a lot's smaller but still the percentage is there 10 percent saying I disagree mm -hmm. okay so we're more or less at 90 and 10 for agree and disagree okay well I did say it was a trick question and personally I disagree and I think it's actually easier than this I don't think that we have to motivate kids I think it's much easier because I actually think that they come pre-motivated you know they are motivated as standard um, I have never met a kid that didn't want to learn to read. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure we all have many, many examples of this with our own children, with nieces and nephews, maybe with grandchildren, with friends' children as well, um, that if you read a story to a child, they enjoy it, definitely. But there comes a moment when they're, they're very surprised by the fact that you as an adult can decodify the, the, you know, these black lines that they see on the page and that you can understand and interpret them and they can't. And children, I think, naturally want to develop independence and autonomy. So there comes a stage when children really want to learn to read for themselves. So, um, as I said, I've never met a child uh, for whom this wasn't the case. Um, so kids are kind of pre-motivated pre to read uh, in, in any case. But the thing is, it seems that in many cases, by the time they get to the middle of uh, the primary stage, um, they don't seem to like reading very much anymore, or they don't seem to want to read. And at that point, I think the problem starts, and suddenly it makes more sense to talk about motivating children to read. So. If they started off loving it before they could read and having this desire to do so, how come in a very short period of time, really, maybe in four or five years, suddenly they don't want to anymore? So my question to you is, open question, what happened? Okay. Why did that change? Okay, so we'll give you um, a couple of say, well, half a minute mm -hmm. to write in answers. It can be short answers, it doesn't have to be complete questions. And um, to answer this question, what happened or what happens in this interval mm -hmm. between the pre-reading stage, stage yeah. and the yeah. 
whether so they can you know they're they're motivated to learn to read they learn to read yes that's wondrous for them yes and then very soon and they very fall soon out of love with it they fall out of love and and and, and think this is boring and yep. it's no longer something that they want to do mm -hmm. okay somebody has written in post reading activities mm -hmm. yeah um, okay but what happened exactly in the to the children they prefer multimedia resources mm -hmm. faster and easier to their eyes maybe but but then what was the case because I mm. assume that you're you're uh, you're saying that this has always been the case yes I think so yeah, yeah. so mm. it's not dependent necessarily on technology yeah. perhaps but thank you um, they've stopped reading for pleasure mm hmm pleasure has gone out of it they don't like those activities because they have to make an effort mm -hmm. um, probably have to motivate them mm -hmm. in these moments it's not funny or interesting for them Martha is saying there are other options to read them that they might enjoy more like mm -hmm. video games but again well, that's been the case for a long time that's been a, the case for a long time mm -hmm. They don't choose the, the story mm, it's that's given yeah. to them so there's no element of choice yep. it's all there on a on um, given, um, we ask them to read boring texts or yep. texts that are not significant yes. for them. Mm -hmm. It's not from Alba, thank you. It's not challenging anymore. Yep. Reading can limit their imagination. Mm -hmm. Karis before was talking about um, fomenting, and, and last year when she gave the talk on creative um, um, possibility was um, to foment uh, imagination. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like. Um, what we offer them to read mm -hmm. they're shy mm -hmm. unsure of themselves mm -hmm. as they get older in okay. primary okay. um so lots a of lot answers. of a lot of good points there yeah i mean i one of the reasons why i believe that all kids want to learn to read is that desire for autonomy so the person who said that um, they don't have any choice as they go through education over what they're going to read. We've taken that autonomy away from them. So the thing that stimulated them to want to be able to do it for themselves, that suddenly disappears when we impose texts um, upon them. Um, I can speak to my own experience. I studied uh, English philology, English language and literature at university because I loved reading. And after I finished my degree, I spent about six months without reading anything. Mm. And that was because in the last year of my degree, I did also have to read a lot of things that I wouldn't have chosen to read. So I, I, I didn't exactly fall out of love with reading, but I did uh, take a bit of a break from it so that I could get back into it with, uh, with reading for pleasure. So I kind of understand what happens to kids here when, when reading is imposed upon them rather than something they have some, some choice over. So giving them some element of choice in anything that they do in education is something I think which can be very uh, motivating for them. Now, I also uh, remember the comments, one that stood out for me, is that we give them boring text to read. Hmm. I think the design of activities can also m inspire them or motivate them to read a text which might actually not be on the most interesting topic for them. So the standard kind of way of working with, um, with, with written texts or with audio texts um, in language classrooms is we need to stimulate and provoke their curiosity first of all so that they, for example, let's say that um, we give them the title of the, the, the story or the, the article or whatever it is they're going to read and we ask them to make predictions about vocabulary that is, that is included in the text. And the first time they read it, they read through the text and the task is see how many of the words that you predicted actually appear in the text. Now, I think that's inherently motivating as a task because we do love to see if our predictions on anything are right. Um, so I think there are things that we can do to make it, texts, even texts which are not the most on the most interesting topics for them, we can still inspire them to read those uh, texts and have some kind of sense of the type of task that you yeah. do and how you exploit the text. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not always just giving them text on things that they're interested in because that's hard sometimes. Yes. So um, in answer to the question myself, I would say, well, this is what happens. And you've mentioned uh, between you in the chat many of the things that happen. But I think to to summarize this, we educate this love of reading out of them by not giving them any choice, by not giving them meaningful tasks to do. Um, if you think about in life in general, we generally read things and then we do something with that information. It doesn't mm. just, um, you know, if you read through the newspaper because you want to find out the cinema times, 
um, or you read, you know, you want to find out the football results or whatever it is. You're reading with a purpose mm. and you kind of do something with that information. Whereas we often expect children to read for reading's sake when we do it in, in education. So um, I think we take away the, the, the love of reading and the inspiration for reading by the choice of things we get them to read and also the things we ask them to do with, uh, with those texts. So, yeah, I've gone on for, uh, uh, about reading for a while, um, but reading is only one small part of literacy. Um, so what I'm interested in now is to know uh, how you would translate literacy into Spanish. Um, just a, you know, a, a, a paraphrase or even just you know, a one-word translation of literacy into Spanish. But then in English, how would you define literacy? What is it? Reading's one part, but there's more than that. So the concept of literacy, okay. what do you think? So first of all, the literacy, the word translated in Spanish, yep. and then in English, yep. a definition. Yes. How would you define exactly. it? Okay, so again, we'll give you half a minute to do that. Um, and let's see what people come and up with. And it's not easy. It's not no, an easy it's thing not to define. Easy, yeah? And it's not easy to translate either. No. I'm not sure that I would. Whoops. Oui. No. Yeah. Um, I would know exactly... Because I'm not sh because I think that I would have to have a very clear idea first of what literacy is yep. before I would be able to translate it. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, it's certainly something you have to think about. I think yes. um, you know it's a it's a word which is used very commonly um, yes. in in English uh, yes. and in education in English. Uh, and in English speaking countries, but even then, I'm not sure that there's yes. a unified idea no. of what it, what it no, refers to. No, we all kind of think that we're all on the same page, yeah. but if we discussed it, perhaps we wouldn't That's be. That's right. Um, so, somebody said thank you. Uh, alphabetization. Yes. Okay, uh, which is a wide term uh -huh. they're saying. Also, lector escritura, uh -huh. learning to read and write. Yep. Again, Fernando is, is, is putting that forward, but as a question, so he's maybe not 100% yep. sure. <laughs> Jose Antonio, literacy is difficult to define. Yep. Um, let's see if there's anything different from what we know. Okay. Okay. Well, the two common translations, I think, are alfabetización and lectoescritura. Um, I have to say I prefer alfabetización because lectoescritura sounds very limited to me. It sounds like the mechanics of reading and writing. Whereas uh, literacy, I think, is much more than this. Just because you can read and write, you can, you can control the mechanics of this, you can decode the code and codify yourself uh, with a pen and paper or on a computer, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're literate. It, it may well have done many, many years mm. ago, but n not these days, I wouldn't say. So literacy is is a lot more than this and I have my um, my ideas here but they are st I, I stress they're still incomplete this doesn't cover everything but I think it's related to texts um, and it's related to being able to read and write different sorts of texts for different purposes um, and it's also understanding about how texts are uh, are produced uh, and how they are understood by readers and also how we can produce them ourselves. Um, I think actually this is, this is still a little bit limited because I think any relationship, any, th any relationship with a text, even if it's talking about a text, is still a kind of literacy moment. Um, but I think it's, it's largely about understanding uh, how texts are produced, uh, how they're organized and, and how we can do this for ourselves and, and with the focus here on different sorts as well. So, um, mm, reading is one part of literacy, writing is another part, but again it is much broader than just this, but we've looked at reading. Now let's look at writing. I said that uh, literacy is much more than lecto escritura for me. It's much more than the mechanics of encoding and deciphering the code. So again, a question for you. Can you teach someone to write? And if so, what things do you need to teach them? And I don't mean, again, understanding the sound letter correspondence and the actual physical act of being able to do it. I mean, can you teach someone to write well? And if so, what do they need to know? Okay, that is a, a challenge. Big question. That yeah. is a big question, but we would love to hear from you. Any ideas on this beyond the, the mechanics, as, as Matthew has said, yeah, of encoding and mm -hmm. deciphering and decoding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
what do you need to do in and, order to and, help somebody to write well? And a, a lot of things, but it's not actually hard. Okay. Hmm. Okay, it's not hard. Okay, let's see what people are going to say. Does anybody agree? Does anybody think yes? Does anybody think no? <laughs> Does anybody and what? Decoding words with figures. Hmm. Okay, so they they think yes. Fine. But beyond the code, the decoding yeah. and the encoding, uh, Martha, thank you. I would l I would try to tap the students' creativity, mm -hmm. tap into their creativity using prompts, for example, images. Yeah. Um, another person, thank you. Uh, vocabulary structure of the text, the process, the planning, the yeah. drafting, the revising, the editing, the publishing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, vocabulary structures, word order, cohesion. Um, another person is saying thank you. Th uh, they can be taught if they have felt the innate desire to write before. Okay. Can you can you stimulate a desire? We could also yes. I'm just um, ask yeah, yeah. that question if they are of a communicative nature. Mm -hmm. Can you actually stimulate that nature? Mm -hmm. Can that be nurtured? Um, teach them exp to express something. Aim. Mm -hmm. Um, aims and purpose mm -hmm. being clear, um, develop ph phonological awareness for mm -hmm. step. Fernando is saying thank you, Fernando. Using reading with images to understand first and com combine images with meaning. Mm -hmm. So they, okay, okay, developing, uh, uh, focusing in on the process okay. and the idea of stimulating yeah. an initial w desire. Okay, so there yeah. seem to be a few comments there about. Um, about creativity, first of all. I think creativity has to happen within a framework, within certain boundaries. Um, the, there, are, there are rules which have to be followed, and of course when, when you're very good at something you can break those rules, but initially probably um, it's very helpful to have a, a guideline and to, and to work within a particular uh, framework. Um, stimulating people to, uh, to have a desire to write. Um, I would say that I enjoy writing sometimes. But quite often, I don't enjoy writing. And I heard somebody else say this, that they don't enjoy writing, but they enjoy having written. Okay. Meaning that the process sometimes can be quite arduous, can be quite tough, can be yes. not a whole lot of fun. But sometimes when you look back on what you've produced, it can be very rewarding. Um, and often that's because you've written with a purpose and you've achieved some kind of... Uh, um, some kind of communicative success and there's some kind of repercussion to what you have written. So I think stimulating or, or encouraging students to write is quite often about what's the result of my writing beyond having just, you know, being, being uh, correct, you know, having my writing corrected and receiving a grade. So is anybody else going to, I mean, writing something that nobody else is going to read, Please. even if it's just a teacher, is That's not it. that motivating really. No? Absolutely. So, and it's so easy to publish these days as well. So. Um, you know, that's always a possibility. But, um, g I, yeah, I mean, people are focused on the process and, um, and certain things that we need to know. And here's a few essentials. It's certainly not exhaustive, and some of them perhaps overlap um, a little bit. Um, and many of these you've already mentioned. Um, so in no particular order, um, I would say that um, initially we have to think about What's the intention of the text? So why are we writing it? What's the purpose? Is there a communicative function? Is there something we're trying to achieve? If we say, for example, writing a recommendation letter or um, we're writing a letter of complaint, then you know, even writing a complaint letter, we're hoping to re receive, um, you know, maybe g get our money back or, um, or get you know, given something for free or at least an apology. No? So if we think about the intention, then it can certainly help guide us. Um, if we're writing a recipe, yeah. mm, there's some intention to communicate to somebody else. Certainly. And that's mm. a, a recipe is a very mm. good example mm. of um, the conventions of certain types of text. Like recipes, all, if you ever go through a recipe book, and some pages have pictures of the final product and others don't, 
I can almost guarantee yes. that you won't try the recipe that doesn't have a picture. Because the convention there is you want to see what's exactly. going to turn out from your exactly. recipe. Exactly. And I'm just thinking in primary, you know, in, in, in the unit on food, for example, yep. often there, there is a, a, a recipe as a, as a reading input. Yep. And then the students, uh, the pupils are, are encouraged to mm -hmm. produce using that model um, a, 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 recipe, a recipe of their own. Yeah, yeah. Of their own which uh, could be with pictures. Yes. Thanks for the example, because a recipe is a very good example. It's yes. a simple kind of text that somebody can produce at primary level, but it has certain langu language requirements. It uses imperatives, no, because you're being told to stir, to pour, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it has, if, uh, you know, on this slide here, um, yeah, language requirements in terms of grammar, but it's also in terms of vocabulary. Um, it has conventions that it probably has a picture it will have, um, again, more language requirements in terms of cohesive devices and first, next, then, finally, mm -hmm. etc. Um, there, uh, there are certain things which must be present. Um, so you have normally a list of ingredients and then a list of things that mm -hmm. you need, etc. So um, someone, we, you know, we might take for granted that a student would automatically know how to write a recipe, but, no. um, but certainly not. You know, no. I don't think that's the case. Um, Notions of, uh, of genre. So, um, you know, we think about genres and, and different genres use different types of language, use different... Um, Stylistic st features. Totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, I remember teaching even to advanced learners when you teach um, sentence inversions, things like, never before had she been into the forest alone. That kind of thing is very complicated grammar. No, it's, it's, you normally find this at kind of C le C1 level. Um, but actually, native speaking kids encounter this difficult structure yes. or supposedly difficult structure in a very natural way in context when the they're story. very small from stories. And actually, it's not that hard even to teach our, uh, our foreign language students to, to do. So there are um, you know, elements of, uh, of genre, genre there as well. Um, if we think about something like perhaps academic writing, like a, 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 you know, a short essay or something like this, there are conventions, we need an introduction, we need body paragraphs, we need a conclusion. Um, if we think about any types of writing, we think about, I don't know, a football match report. You know, get three or four of them together and you'll realize that they all follow uh, a very particular structure. You know, and, and actually, we're often not aware of this, but if we were to read a football match report that didn't follow that structure, we would feel that something was slightly wrong mm -hmm. and we'd find it slightly hard to follow because we've been accustomed to these um, conventions. We need to think as well who we're writing for. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, who is the intended audience. And when we take this into account, we also need to think about what's the, what register we need to use. Um, I often find, for example, with um, with my students at university sometimes, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised by their limitations of register when they switch from formal to informal situations or they send emails and things like this and they kind of get it wrong and they have one register for, um, for pretty much every situation. Uh, and this is something, you know, which we can certainly work on with, uh, with students. So, you know, there's a whole host of things here. Uh, and I said before, it's, it's, there are a lot of things, but it's not difficult. And it comes down to thinking about text types, thinking about the conventions, perhaps analyzing text to see what kind of language they include, what content, and also um, what structure. Um, and then working from there, you can teach anybody to write any type of text in a more simple or a more complex form. Right. So yeah, those are kind of the essentials, really. Um, and this is the big idea today that I hope you take away. Um, the idea of literacy across the curriculum. Every teacher is a language teacher, whether they're teaching a language subject or not. Um, and the reason for this is because, you know, even in a maths class, in a science class, in a history class, in an art class, you can't talk about art without the language of art. You can't talk about history without the language of history. And in Every subject, you are going to encounter certain types of text. So, you know, a scientific report has certain conventions that need to be followed. It has certain structure, certain language, and so on. Um, a historical recount, the same thing, you know, it's going to be principally in the past tense. 
you're going to have language of cause and consequence and so on. Um, in, uh, in, in art, right. things yeah. like, you know, you might have a picture description, you're going to have yes. prepositions of place, words which refer specifically to colour, um, to, um, to shape and things like this. So, you know, in, or in order to be um, educated, let's say, in any, in any yes. curricular area really, you need to be able to control the, um, the, the language mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that, you know, English teachers can do to support, particularly you know, in, in bilingual schools as well, which language teachers can do to support subject learning in, uh, you know, content learning in, in different subjects. So, I had the list on the screen before of, uh, of conventions, of genre, of cohesive divisive, you know, devices and so on. But it essentially comes down to this. Now, I wish it were three things because three, three is the magic number, but it's four things really. So I, I think in any type of writing, um, we need to know what language is required. We need to know what the content of that particular type of text should be. And we need to know how that text is um, normally structured. Um, and the fourth thing really is the purpose. So what is the, uh, what is the aim of the text? Now, the purpose is, is not always absolutely crucial. But for example, I know in the case of um, you know, official exams, um, English language exams, the purpose or the task completion is one of the uh, criteria that's taken into account. So you could have lovely structure, you know, you could have great vocabulary, but you know, there's always a list of things that you're supposed to include and things that you're supposed to achieve with the text. So thinking about this, you know, these, these four things really, um, if ever we want to get our students to write something, um, then these are the four things we need to take into account in order to be able to, um, to guide them. Um, but taking a big step back now and going right to the beginning, going back to uh, me saying that you know pre-reading children have uh, uh, a desire to read and we need to maintain this rather than create it or perhaps we need to enhance it um, and this starts with creating a literacy environment so this is the kind of environment in which reading and writing can be stimulated and there are several things we can do um, I think uh, you know, in, in, at very young ages, the the presence of the written word in the classroom can be very helpful, even if at this moment they're they're you know they're not reading yet and they can't read. At least they're becoming familiar with this and they realise that you know text is all around them and it's potentially very useful. And actually, very early on, children you know when they have this initiation into reading, they start being able to recognise some words by their overall shape, even if they can't break down the individual letter and so on. So labelling things will familiarise children with the uh, with the written forms. A word of warning here: um, posters can be very useful. They can be very helpful. Um, again, it's another way to not just to decorate the classroom but also to make the written word very present. Um, but there is a movement a little bit in education at the moment actually to make spaces, learning spaces, l slightly less stimulating. That's to err on the side of caution and be slightly under-stimulating rather than over-stimulating because I'm sure we've all seen classrooms which have got things hanging from the ceiling, you know, all the walls are covered and it's just an overload of information which can actually be distracting. But I think a judicious use of posters um, for things that come up a lot in class, our scaffolding can certainly be, be very helpful for them. And you know, you see on here the quiet sign, for example. Well, they might not be able to read the word quiet yet, but if every time you point at it and you say quiet, they will soon recognise this combination of letters and they'll, they'll know what this, um, you know, this six-sided shape uh, refers to, right? So it's a, it's a good way to, to introduce them. Messages. Um, you know, we communicate a lot by speaking in the classroom, but you know, there are times when um, we can uh, use literacy as an excuse to try and get um, them to communicate with us, talking obviously now um, early primary and mid-primary, to communicate with us and to communicate with each other and for us to communicate with them through the written word rather than just through uh, speaking. So this again kind of normalizes the use of uh, writing to transmit messages. 
Reading aloud, certainly um, in uh, pre-primary and early primary. When I say reading aloud, I mean us, not them. Um, I'm not a big fan of reading aloud because I think it's, it's actually a very difficult thing to do and even people who are highly literate in their own language may not be yeah. very good at reading aloud. I'm certainly not very good at reading aloud um, in English and I'm absolutely terrible at doing it in Spanish. Um, so I think you know this can sometimes create the illusion of, of communicative competence um, or we might think it's important for pronunciation but you know we often don't pronounce that well when we're reading aloud because yeah. we're fixated on other things as well. Um, but certainly us trying to read aloud to kids so they become used to this formulaic language that appears in stories for example um, and you know we can really get them to interact and be involved with the story as well you know we don't just read from beginning to end mm. we stop and pause there are other people who tell you much more about uh, storytelling well Caris was, was talking this before, earlier yeah. about I, it, yes. I, I imagine yes. um, and, and also discovering different types of text so it doesn't just have to be stories that we read aloud to them you know it can be factual information as well so creating the environment is, is crucial from the beginning, I think. But the other thing is the idea of literacy events. So we have two ideas here, the literacy environment and literacy events. Um, and what is a liter literacy event? Well, writing or reading a birthday card. So having some kind of birthday routine with kids could be quite, um, you know, just something that happens occasionally in class whenever somebody has a, a birthday card. Uh, sorry, whenever someone has a birthday. It could yeah. be quite frequent. Yes, it could be. Yeah, yeah in a class of 30 kids, yeah, it's <laughs> going to happen quite often. Um, and listening to a story being read aloud, this is still a literacy moment. We associate literacy with being able to read and write. And even if kids can't yet, having a story being read aloud to them is still a literacy event. So the question for you now is, can you think of any other literacy events maybe literacy events that happen in our everyday life, not just in the classroom, and which of those do we do or could we do with infant or primary children? Great. Okay, so again, we'll give you half a minute to send in your answers to this question, um, because you mentioned about the be birthday um, card, and that's mm -hmm. a lovely, and it's a routine, mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, the, and you, very you formulaic. And form very formulaic, and, and one which provides them with a lot of exposure. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, which you were talking yeah. about before. It's that the repetition. Re yeah. repetition. Um, but it's not overload mm -hmm. either. Um, one other person is saying thank you. Uh, board games. Yeah, Using certainly. board can be an event. Yeah. Yes. Particularly and again if there are rules which need to be explained. Exactly, and there's certain language. Yeah. Um, th so for turn taking, it's your turn. Yeah. Whose turn is it now? Um, roll the dice, mm -hmm. um, move forward, one, two, three yep. spaces, mm -hmm. move back, yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. and the kind of rules associated, so there's a lot of r routine and go formulaic, down the snake, yeah. yes, <laughs> go down the snake, go up the snake, um, use of prepositions mm -hmm. there, um, excellent, and another person is saying notes for friends. Certainly, yeah, of course. Not just for the teacher. Yep. Post-it notes and reminders and, and things reminders like this. And yeah. reminders. And reminders to oneself. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. And memory games. Mm -hmm. uh, another person is saying writing the routines, the weather, the date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, singing songs from Juan Antonio. Thank you. Reciting poems. Mm -hmm. Role-playing in class. Acting out. Mm -hmm. um, another person is saying traveling bags. Children can freely take a bag with a book and a magazine. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, there's some great ideas coming through here. A, um, and we have um, so Martha saying, thank you, Martha. We have board monitors mm -hmm. that take care of preparing the board, the date, the weather, the activity of the day. Um, another person saying reading poetry, text about me, talking about me. Mm -hmm. That can be an event. Yeah. Short poems, inventing stories, mm -hmm. sending real postcards. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about we did, that yeah. earlier, didn't we? And um, ah, not just birthdays, but Valentine's Day. Ah, true. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Anything that is transactional yes. is, very, uh, is very useful and very motivating. It's not just writing something, it's writing something and receiving something yes. in return. So, yes. um, yeah, like right, you know, to and from the teacher. You know, the teacher chooses a handful of students that they will write to. In, a, in any given week and the students have to reply or, 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 or vice versa, right? Um, there are lots of things we do. We have 
hundreds of literacy events that we probably don't even think about in, in, in real life. Um, but the things that you've mentioned here are, are, very, are very similar to my own list, really. And this, of course, is not an exhaustive list. It's a few ideas. Um, but I think anything that, you know, routines that we have in class, if we can make those routines include the written word, then, then great. So the birthday routine of, you know, when it is someone's birthday that, you know, the other students kind of get together and write the birthday card with the help of the teacher or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the weather chart somebody the weather mentioned. Chart. The St. Valentine's Day card from yep. Emma mm, is a, a version of the yep. birthday routine. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, and then the classroom duties, the rotors for various things that happen in the classroom that, you know, different students have responsibility for. Um, reading the register, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a classic one, no? a different child mm -hmm. reads the register every day to see if everybody's present or who is and who isn't. Recording reading process, uh, progress, keeping a, a log of the things that you have read as well mm -hmm. is a very nice way of, um, you know, whenever we, yeah, whenever we record anything, it makes us conscious of, uh, exactly. of what we've done. So, you know, there are a whole host of things and I would just, you know, encourage you to try and think of more that you could do. Um, but we've laid, we've laid the foundations now. So we, we, we have uh, a literacy environment uh, from pre-primary uh, and right the way through primary too. We have trying to introduce literacy events so that reading and writing um, and you know, texts and their structure and, their, and so on becomes a part of everyday life. Um, but really moving on uh, is getting to the stage where we can read, analyze and produce texts. And I think those three things go, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very closely linked. So what I have here, which you'll have on your handout, um, is thinking of a text type, book reviews. Uh, and I think this is a great one because, you know, we often get students to write summaries of things. And I always think that a summary is not a great task because it's kind of low level thinking. It's essentially demonstrating that you understand something. And a summary is often just an inferior version of the original text. And it really only demonstrates that you've understood the original. Whereas writing a book review has an evaluative element to it. It's a higher order thinking skill because at the end, the final thing that you get is would you recommend a book or not uh, to another child or to somebody else? And if so, who would you recommend it to? What kind of person would enjoy this book? So what I have here are um, genuine book reviews that have been written by kids, um, eight, nine year old kids. And what's the first thing that strikes me as being obvious is that somebody taught them how to do this because each one is exactly the same. They have three paragraphs, they have a picture, they have the same information at the top of the page, they have the same content in each of the paragraphs. So somebody clear, this didn't happen by chance. So what's, what we have here is a sequence of activities designed to guide students to being able to produce something which models this, something which, uh, which imitates this. So the first task that we have on here is um, recognizing certain functions in certain language. So things are color coded within the text so that they become, you know, so that they become very obvious. Um, and what the students have to do first of all is to look at those colors um, and to decide which uh, language or which uh, content they, they correspond to. And then in point two, they're given another one and here the paragraphs are in the wrong order, but we have the names of the paragraphs here and what they have to do is by comparing with uh, the two examples, the two complete examples they've been given, they have to try and put those paragraphs in the same order, something which is not difficult for them. But what we've done now is we've given a title to each paragraph which indicates very strongly what the content of that paragraph is. So we're working on the content and the structure of, this, of the conventions of this type of text. Now, if we move on, um, the next thing that they have to do is to analyze uh, another sample. And this one is not so good. Again, it's fairly obvious that it's missing a picture. So that gives them a clue that, hmm, all is not well here. And if we look at this one, it certainly doesn't have the three paragraph structure um, that the previous examples have. We have one, two, three, four, five paragraphs here. Um, a couple of those are just single sentences and so on. So we're moving here from kind of identifying certain characteristics. We're moving towards evaluating another example. Mm -hmm. And they are also asked here to make suggestions for improvement. And what they have to do is to compare with the three 
good examples and try and make this one look a bit more like that. So there's obviously a, 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 a clear progression in the difficulty of what they have to do. The next thing they have to do is to um, use this table to evaluate or to analyze, let's say, rather than evaluate the, the first three examples they're given, the good examples, let's say, and to see which of these elements are present. And what they'll discover here is that in each of those texts, all of these elements are present. Mm. So this is kind of the criteria for how to write this kind of text. What's the content, what's the structure, and what's the, the language. Then the next thing they have to do is to use this uh, writing frame here. Writing frames are great because different types of text also have different layouts. You know, they have a, they have a certain um, physical organization. So here they need to include the picture, they need to include the information at the top. It's very clear that they have to make three paragraphs here. Um, they're given the language that they need to use as well um, in order to um, make the text cohesive. And then when they finish theirs, what they need to do is swap their book review with a partner mm -hmm. and use this rubric here in order to evaluate their partner's text. So what's happening here is there's a lot of analysis, there's a lot of evaluation. Um, they can sit with their partner later and you're going to go through the rubric and the partner can give them advice. This kind of formative assessment, this kind of metacognitive thinking about thinking uh, process is very powerful for their learning. It makes you know these characteristics uh, stand out. It makes them very salient. Um, and then finally, you know they've they've gone through a writing process where they've they've checked their own work, they've checked their partners, they've gone back and revised it. And then finally, they will give this to the uh, to the tutor, uh, the teacher rather, and and the teacher can then you know correct it, give them feedback or or whatever. Now. The final thing, as we said here, this has to finish with a recommendation. You know, who would like to read this, uh, you know, who, who would enjoy reading this book? So then, this is not something I don't think that should be marked by the teacher, then given back to the student, and that's the end of it. No, this is the kind of thing that can go up on the wall. This is the kind of thing that students can have access to so that they can read each other's, and then they will be, you know, guided in selecting a book that they might like to read thanks to their, their classmates. So, you know, imagine how excited one of, the, one of the students might be, one of the pupils might be, if, you know, people are queuing up to read the book that they recommended. Sure. You know, there's a, real, um, there's a real consequence to what they've, uh, to what they've written. So, in order to, uh, to sum up, um, you know, six points here, really, that I'd like to drive home a little bit more. Um, our job is not to motivate so much as to maintain the inherent motivation. You know, they come pre-motivated and all we have to do, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard, right? I mean, we should be unhappy with ourselves if we're not able to maintain what, you know, they already bring to the classroom. Um, so, you know, that's an encouraging thought as well, you know, that we just have to maintain motivation. We don't necessarily need to create it, maintain it and maybe enhance it slightly. Liter literacy is a lot more than just reading and writing. Reading, re lecto escritura. Reading and writing is the mechanics. Being literate, knowing how texts function, being able to produce them yourselves, to analyse them, and so on, is you know is uh, is much more than just reading and writing. Literacy is the t is the responsibility of every teacher. Uh, language across the curriculum. We encounter language and text types in every single subject. Um, and you know this is something that uh, we, we certainly shouldn't forget. It's uh, it's the responsibility of, of all of us. Um, laying the foundations to start with, you know, we need a, a very strong foundation, and that is thanks to the pre motivation. We can build on that by creating a literacy environment, and also um, you know making sure that literacy events happen on a daily basis in the classroom. If we want to teach students how to write well. We can do it without too much difficulty. It requires a little bit of analysis of text types on our part, but there are four considerations that we have to take into account, which are language, structure, content, and the purpose and perhaps the repercussions of their having written the text. And um, we do this if we want to create a, a lesson sequence which is uh, you know, uh, interested in them producing a text at the end of it, then they need to read they need to analyze and then they need to be given the opportunity to produce this kind of text in a, in a guided way. Uh, and by doing this, I think, uh, you know, we can, 
certainly in, enhance um, students' literacy well beyond the just reading and writing. So um, right. that brings us to the end. Yes, um, that, was, that was very, very um, insightful, I think, and very thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. And so. thank you for, for, for putting that in, in, in a very short space of time, mm -hmm. something which is very profound, mm -hmm. has profound implications Certainly. for across mm -hmm. the curriculum, not just in the English language mm -hmm. class in pre-primary and primary, but mm -hmm. across the curriculum and other subjects. Um, so now, if you would like to send in any comments or questions about what um, Matthew has been discussing, the framework he's put mm -hmm. forward, the, the key messages that mm -hmm. I think you have made very clear throughout the um, talk, um, please do so now. We'll give, you, we'll, we'll give you, say, a minute or less than a minute to send in any comments or questions that you would like to make. Um, you've made me think very much um, quite deeply as you've been... Okay, well, yeah, no, good. seriously. <laughs> um, and the question that you initially, or at, uh, towards the beginning of the um, talk where you asked about, you know, how would you translate literacy mm -hmm. into Spanish and what, what is the de mm -hmm. definition, how would you define it? Mm -hmm. you've, you've done that. In, 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 in the mm -hmm. talk and that it was broader and I think one person, I can't remember, was it um, Juan Antonio or mm -hmm. somebody else was saying that um, they were translated as uh, alphabetization as a broader term, mm -hmm. it's much broader than yep. the simple decoding, mm -hmm. encoding mm -hmm. um, mechanics yep. as you say mm -hmm. and that we have to draw on the, yeah. in a, the motivation that's there already, draw mm -hmm. on that and keep it yeah. and hopefully enhance it. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yes. And, and, and literacy, um, the, our own development of literacy, I think, you know, that there is the chance that it never really finishes because I, I feel that I write certain types of text quite well. Yes. But there are other types of text. Yes even as a literate adult who's interested in this, that I wouldn't write very well because I'm still not, I've never sat down and analysed the conventions and, exactly. and what it takes to write a good exactly. example of that type exactly. of text. Exactly, so how can you produce yeah. if there's no understanding of what's involved? Yeah. Exactly. But the skills of analysing a text and being able to identify its characteristics so you can imitate that. Exactly. When you can do it for a handful of text types, you can do it for any type of text. Exactly. Um, thanks a lot from Martha. Thank you, Martha. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Now to keep those kids motivated yeah. forever. <laughs> keep the motivation going, exactly. And Anna, thank you, Anna, is asking, should we correct all the mistakes the students do make when they, when they write? Um, ah. She's talking about older students. Yeah. So you would be talking about from, say, 10 to yep. 11. Um, mm -hmm. and perhaps she's referring to primary 5 and primary 6. What, what do that's, you, how that's, do you feel about that? That's a great question because... And I'm sure there's not one No. Necessary. Error correction and, and the correction of mistakes is very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, I think it, provi it you know, provides... The, the, the fact that you asked the question provides, shows that it provides headaches for us. Yes. Um, and I would say that it doesn't make a lot of sense for me, personally, to correct every single mistake. I have to decide what is the purpose of the, the writing and what are the things which you know, I consider to be important and what is it that I am assessing, even if it's informally assessing, just to give them feedback. So if I'm interested in them using uh, discourse markers, connectors and things like that, and if your student writes in the one hand instead of on the one hand, I'll correct that. But if they get a preposition wrong somewhere else but it's not really the focus of what we're uh, working on, then I might ignore it. I might let it pass because you know, it would be quite demotivating, I think, to correct absolutely everything and to have everything exactly. underlined. So I think we need to be, you know, we need to prioritise in any text. Yeah, yes. certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, and somebody else is asking, how many types of text would you recommend to work on in one school year? I mm. mean, I how many? I'm not sure that we, we can put a number on it, but maybe could we also consider different types of text? Certainly, yeah. Um, mm. I think um, if we take any type of text, it can also be broken down into sub-genres. No? So if you think about letters, you have formal letters and informal letters, for example. Mm. If you think about the purpose of any letter that we write, 
I mentioned before a, a letter of complaint, a recommendation letter. Um, when you write a letter of, we call a covering letter, no, a letter of presentation if you're um, asking for a, a job. Okay, perhaps not in primary, but um, if we think about letters, it's not just the format, it's the purpose as well. And there are so many kind of subcategories of even yes. just letters and, but and how stories. Many, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to put a number on it. Mm. Is, is it. Is it not more, would it not be more important to consider of the, the different types, a certain number of different types mm -hmm. and the purpose? And I, yeah. I don't know. I'm putting it to you I, because I'm I think this is a complicated question. I am to in answer. favour of mm -hmm. depth yes. rather than width w yes. or breadth when it comes to content. Okay. So I think I would sooner dedicate more time to being able to write even, let's say, two or three yes. text types well, because the skills that students will develop. If you followed a sequence such as the one that I proposed, where mm -hmm. they see good examples, they see good models, they're asked to analyze them, and then they're given the chance to evaluate them and to imitate them. If you did that with two or three different types of text, you would be providing them with the skills yeah. to be able to do that for themselves with other types of text exactly. in the Exactly. So you would be providing them with the skills that they can transfer. Exactly. Transferable skills. Yeah. OK. Excellent. Um, let me see, thank you. Maria del Pilar says thank you a lot, and thank you to M Maria Pilar. Um, there's a lot, any question? I'm just checking. Okay, Juan Antonio is asking a question. Would you recommend to preserve some time, uh, set aside some time, especially for reading regular books as a daily, on a daily basis, um, maybe three times a week? Um, he's talking particularly again yep. l uh, l um, later in primary, so mm -hmm. primary six, yep. primary five perhaps as well, but he's saying primary six. I would say so because I think we, we have to encourage and maintain the reading habit. And I think if you, if you dedicate certain time in class to reading and it's things that the students have some choice to, you know, they have a choice over what they read, then I can imagine quite easily a situation where you start reading in class and you're given, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is to read, and then the teacher stops you, maybe not at an opportune moment. Hopefully that would inspire the students as well to say, well, I'm, I'm going to continue reading this at home or on the way home because, you know, I see there's only two pages left till the end of the chapter yes. or whatever. So um, I think, uh, you know, kind of it's time very well invested. It might be very hard to say, well, what was the specific objective of, giving the students or giving the pupils 20 minutes to read. What was the teacher doing at, at that moment? Sometimes the teacher feels guilty when they're not actively instructing. But the benefits of, uh, of dedicating that time to reading and creating the habit, I think, are perfectly justified. And the teacher you know, there's no, you know, should have no qualms or no worries about dedicating time yes. to that. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think you've, um, you've provoked an awful lot of interest. Mm -hmm. You certainly, um, we've, got ha we've had many questions there that people are obviously mm -hmm. very keen. Um, and to, I think people will go away now with some very practical I hope so. um, ideas to implement in yep. the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think you've helped us to really rethink mm -hmm. literacy. Okay. And that's that's Great. Uh, what I hope for. Yeah, what I hope for. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for attending. <laughs>